you. Thank you so much. I'm going to do this old school. It's great to be here, and it's great to speak to you today. So I'm going to focus my talk on Signal. I'm going to look at the private messaging app itself, the political economy shaping the tech ecosystem within si which Signal operates, and how Signal has structur structured itself to thrive even as it rejects the dominant surveillance business model. Now, I currently serve on Signal's board of directors, and I'll be taking an extended role at Signal soon, but more on that in a moment. So first, let's start with a brief overview. What is Signal? Now, Signal was founded in 2015 by Moxie Marlinspike, whom we have to thank for his years of care and labor. To the people who use Signal, like me and maybe you, it might feel similar to WhatsApp, Telegram, or iMessage. You open your phone, you text a friend, you share a photo, directions to a party, or whatever. It's straightforward, it's intuitive, and it's ultimately a tool for connection and communication. But the similarity between Signal and the other dominant messengers is only skin deep. Below the surface, Signal is very special. It is truly private and secure, providing a rare safe haven for honest communication in a world where our most intimate moments, our relationships, our locations, preferences, and habits are surveilled, cataloged, and used to inform significant decisions that shape our lives and opportunities. Now, Signal uses strong end-to-end -end encryption, so the only people who can see your messages are the people you're talking to. Not Signal, not outsiders, not tech platforms, and not a state with a subpoena. No one else. We take every step we can to minimize metadata, to open our code, code to scrutiny, and to otherwise make sure that we know nothing about you, your friends, or what you're saying to them. And this matters. I'm giving this talk in Berlin, a place where privacy awareness runs deep. And I think it's fair to say that this awareness is not divorced from history. So understanding this history can help us augur abstract concepts of privacy in human experience. During the mid-20th century, the US-based company IBM sold Hollerith machines to states across the globe as a tool to expand and expedite census taking, among other things. Now, Hollerith machines were proto-computers. They allowed structuring, processing, and tabulation of data at a much faster rate and in much more standardized forms than was possible manually. IBM's Hollerith systems underwrote many state census projects with unremarkable outcomes. They were also a key tool used by the Nazi regime to conduct a series of population censuses which were announced weeks after Hitler took office in 1933. The machines and custom punch cards were designed in a collaboration between IBM's German subsidiary and the regime in order to count and classify every citizen by age, religion, gender, location, and so on. The head of IBM's German subsidiary at the time put it this way, quote, We are very much like the physician, in that we dissect, cell by cell, the German cultural body. We report every individual characteristic on a little card. These characteristics are grouped like the organs of our cultural body, and they will be calculated and determined with the help of our tabulating machine. So the classificatory capabilities of early computation enabled this so-called dissection, the separation of some people from others, the tracking and targeting of these others, and ultimately, the systematization of genocide. Indeed, at the beginning, the five digits tattooed on the arms of prisoners entering concentration camps corresponded to their individual Hollerith code. Of course, we can't fall prey to technological determinism. Hollerith machines did not cause the Holocaust. But the data they were able to put in the hands of the Nazi regime provided a powerful tool that the state used to expedite and organize mass murder. And it also pro provided great profit to IBM. Here, it's worth mentioning that the history of the powerful using information about those with less power to do harm is not contained to Germany. Only a few years later, the United States illegally used its own census data to identify and de detain Japanese Americans. And I could spend the rest of this talk listing similar examples, but I think I've made my point. So now let's turn to the present. The tech industry today is grounded in the surveillance business model, far beyond the wildest dreams of Hollerith-era IBM. It's the norm, not the exception, that a deluge of intimate information is created and collected about us as a routine part of our participating in the world. And we don't know and we can't trace where this data goes or precisely how it's used. 
to compare the quantity and granularity of this modern information to the census information collected and computed by Holler Earth Systems is to compare Mount Everest to a grain of sand. And this information is currently in the hands of tech companies, companies that are routinely compelled to share it with states, creating a nexus of state and corporate surveillance that cannot be reasonably separated. So it should, come as, it, it, so it should not be controversial to say that we need to be willing to examine the potential harms that could occur if this data and the massive infrastructures of surveillance and processing currently controlled by private corporations were met with a different political regime and with new and grim business opportunities. What could happen if those motivated by goals of social control and oppression gained access to this apparatus? Now, I don't have a totalizing answer or a rosy solution. And I am in no way implying that Signal solves the whole of this thorny nest of problems. But I do think this account helps emphasize why spaces where private, why spaces where private digital communication is possible are so existentially important, and why providing this capability is Signal's sole mission. So it, it's at this point that I'd like to dig into what it takes to create Signal and to ensure that Signal grows and thrives in a tech ecosystem shaped by surveillance. So to ground us, I'm going to start with a quick, incomplete history. It goes something like this. Networked computation began as a military initiative, in the US at least, and was largely funded by the US government, who also underwrote the computing industry for much of its history. Cold War fears were an animating force throughout. Fast forward to the turn. Fast forward, and the turn to neoliberal policy in the 1980s was accompanied by the privatization of the internet in the 1990s, which until then existed primarily as a research network. An exploration of viable internet business models followed, along with much bombastic rhetoric that rewrote the military history of networked computation with an emphasis on its liberatory potential. This rhetoric, though often inaccurate, was essential to shaping the mythology of Silicon Valley and the popular image of the current tech industry. Now, after some false starts, surveillance advertising emerged as the successful internet business model, and surveillance remains the foundation of the current tech industry. This model underwrote and incentivized the metastasis of so-called free products and services from search to email to social networks, you know them, right? And to power these free products and the valuable data collection they enabled, the firms at the forefront steadily built and invested in massive computational infrastructure and techniques to enable the rapid processing and storage of this data. So this brings us to a key point. The surveillance business model trends toward consolidation, or natural monopoly as in the language of economists. The tech companies who honed the internet surveillance business model early had the opportunity to accrue massive infrastructures, massive data stores, and large customer bases from which to continually pull data. These are resources that can competitors cannot simply buy or bootstrap, and they are self-reinforcing. Almost without exception, the companies early to this model are the firms we now refer to as big tech. It's also no accident that in the early 2010s, when tech industry consolidation was beginning to calcify, we saw a sudden turn to so-called artificial intelligence. Now, the AI field is over 70 years old, and it has gone through many twists and turns. So the question we should ask is, why did it emerge right then? This is the general question that has been the focus of my scholarly work for the past many years. And in answering it, we can better understand the ramifications of the surveillance business model. So first, AI, artificial intelligence, is not a technical term of art. It is a marketing term that has been applied to a hodgepodge of data-centric techniques. Second, the sudden shift to AI in the early 2010s had everything to do with tech industry consolidation and the resources at the heart of the surveillance business model. We see this clearly when we recognize that what was new about AI in the early 2010s was not new innovations in machine learning or algorithmic techniques. What, indeed, the methods that were applied to prove AI's newfound utility date from the 1980s. What was new were the significant amounts of available data used to train AI models and the power of the computational infrastructure available to conduct this training and calibration, resources concentrated in the hands of a few private tech companies care of the surveillance business model. So if we look from this perspective, we see that AI's primary role has been to expand 
what can be done with the massive amounts of surveillance data collected and stored by large tech companies? By sprinkling the magic of AI, by sprinkling the magic of AI, surveillance data could be used to create models of reality that are then applied across nearly every domain of human life to make predictions and determinations, from transportation to education to medicine to a list well too long to name. And it's worth noting that this too produces intimate data about us, which often has power over us, and even power over us, even if this data emerges via predictive models, not via direct surveillance or data collection. So this marketing narrative of AI mystified, entrenched, and expanded the surveillance business model at the heart of the tech industry. So with this history and context in mind, let's turn again to Signal and what it takes for Signal to operate in the ecosystem we've just explored. Because of course, the context within which we live and function cannot be wished away. This is true of life, this is true for Signal. And for Signal, this means we need to provide a messaging service that works according to the dominant norms and expectations and does so in a private and secure way. Now, of course, we could insist on ignoring these norms. But Signal isn't willing to be relegated to the dusty corner of thought experiments that are theoretically secure and private, but fail at their purpose in the real world because no one can and will use them. This point gets missed, although it seems obvious in hindsight. A communications app that your friends don't use is useless. So honoring and meeting people's needs and expectations in ways that ensure Signal is pleasant and useful is essential to our privacy mission. We'll add stickers or group video calling, or increased administrative control for group chats, or whatever it is if we recognize it as a meaningful tool people use to communicate, and we can do it in accordance with our strict privacy promises. But of course, meeting these norms is also often a lot harder for Signal than it is for surveillance messengers. It may look the same, but there's far more care, care and work required on the back end to ensure it's actually private and secure. It's whatever the opposite of a Potemkin village is. Product norms are not the only things influenced by the surveillance business model. The imperatives of tech organizations in general are also shaped by these forces. And this means Signal needs to structure our technical architecture, organizational form, and business model in ways that both acknowledge and reject these dominant tech industry paradigms. So at the level of the product, we do this by implementing technical boundaries that make it impossible to collect, retain, or use your data. So we can't sell it. We can't build ad targeting with it. We can't use it to train AI, and we don't have analytics or trackers or advertising. We also make our code open to public scrutiny, and this means you can hold us to our word. Now, at the level of the organization, we are structured as a 501c3 nonprofit with the Signal Foundation dedicated to solely supporting the development and care of the Signal Messenger. This is a form that those in this room will be very familiar with. And it means that we're transparent with, the, with where the money goes, that the private companies can't acquire us, and that we don't have shareholders or equity, so we're not being pushed to prioritize profits and growth over our core values. Now, these choices protect Signal at the level of product integrity and mission alignment within the organization. But these aren't the only things that we need to continue growing and thriving. I'll put a fine point on it. It costs a lot to develop and maintain high availability software, and these significant forever costs aren't widely understood in part because they've been obscured behind free products underwritten by surveillance. So while Signal won't participate in the surveillance business model, this doesn't mean it's any cheaper for us. It costs tens of millions of dollars a year to develop and care for Signal. And this is a very lean budget given our reach and scope. So for comparison, WhatsApp has over 1,000 engineers. That's just engineers. Telegram has around 500 employees, and Signal, which is by far the most widely used private and secure messaging app, has a team that totals around 40 people. They're 40 brilliant people, but that's everyone. Thank you. And I want the team back home to receive that applause. <laughs> yeah, even more of it. Um, that's everyone like designers, product managers, engineers who have to build multiple clients for each operating system and keep them maintained. That's the support people, that's the board, that's all of us, right? And in addition, we of course also have to pay for hosting and registration, which are very, very expensive and non-negotiable if we want Signal to meet the expectations of the people who rely on it, expectations that require us to be always instantly available 
everywhere. So how do we pay for this? Well, Brian Acton's vision and generosity has given us the gift of a strong foundation that we can build on as we work to create a model for long-term sustainability. And with the costs in the tens of millions of dollars a year, a model for sustainability is extremely important. Now, as to the model we'll be pursuing, we believe that a broad base of support that enlists the people who rely on Signal is the most robust option for us. And importantly, it's the least likely to be suddenly disrupted. I am convinced that among the many millions of people using Signal, there are enough who are willing to make a small sustaining donation to cover these costs. Now, at this point, we've only just begun experimenting with this small donor model. We've been offering badges to donors and occasionally letting people know that, hey, you can donate if you'd like. And the response has been really heartening. To me, it points to a future in which small donations from millions of people support Signal, creating a template for how we might develop and maintain core technical infrastructure like Signal outside of the surveillance business model. I hope what I've covered thus far helps make clear how special and important Signal is, and the significant amount of work, thought, and resources required to create and care for Signal. Signal provides a safe haven outside of the pervasive surveillance that is the hallmark of the current tech industry. And I sincerely believe that Signal being widely used and available to people across the globe is necessary to ensure a livable future. Now, I've been committed to Signal since before it was called Signal and I've been on the Signal Foundation's board of directors since 2020. So I'm happy to announce here in Berlin for the first time publicly that on September 12th, I will be taking a new full-time role as Signal's president. Thank you. You heard it here first, purpose ownership. <laughs> Um, after a lot of thinking and discussion, it became clear to me that caring for Signal was the most important thing I could do with my time and expertise, and I am sincerely honored to be taking this role. I'll be publishing more details on my mission and on my vision for this role on the Signal site soon. Um, but for now, I just want to thank everyone here, and I want to say that I look forward to engaging with this community in the future as we work to hone alternative models that can support tech done otherwise. Thank you. Oh. Thank you so much, Meredith. Um, we again have the opportunity to have two, maybe three questions, depending on the questions. Yeah. Okay. Hello, um, my name is Mo from Zebra Growth. Um, I have a quick question. When you were looking at different revenue models, and obviously it seems like the donation one is probably the most, yeah, one that makes most sense at mm -hmm. the minute. I'm sure a lot of people would be really curious about what other options you're looking into. So freemium, premium, why was that excluded? Is there any other core business models that you are looking at that you think also has potential within this kind of equitable state? Yeah, I mean, I think it's hard to put a pin on the like years of discussion we've had. Um, it's maybe more of a coffee conversation. But I will say that there's a lot of kind of intuitive models like subscriptions, right? That make sense for some products or technical services, but like quickly we can answer that it doesn't make sense for Signal because of course I don't want to talk to just people who subscribe to Signal or have the resources to do so, right? So Signal's utility counts on a kind of pervasive network effect that would preclude that as an option given our mission. So, you know, I could go through a list and kind of give similar answers that sort of rely on a kind of, you know, having marinated with, you know, Signal's mission for a long time, but um, there are a lot of nuances to particularly what we want to do vis-a-vis -vis providing ubiquitous private, uh, um, private messaging that, um, that made the, the sort of donor model the most sustainable in our, in our view. And right, we're, we're experimenting with it. So if it doesn't work, we're going to be you know, always asking those questions. That's our role as leadership of the organization to make sure that you know, we're making the right choices and correcting them if they don't work. Thanks. Another. Thank you for that great talk. My name is Peter. I'm representing the Open Source Business Alliance in Germany. 
and uh, I think you very well pointed out the dangers of the surveillance uh, economy, but I think there's another danger which we all know of social media, that is the creation of bubbles uh, where certain talks happen which are not open to open discussion to the press, to um, to, to discussions with other uh, parts of the society. And uh, I wonder, especially since you're not tapping into the conversations of your users, which I think is, is really the way to go, uh, what do you think about uh, the, the existence of and, and the creations and the evolving of these dangerous bubbles and are you planning to do anything about it? I, you know, everyone has their role and they, that might not be my lane. Um, but I do think, you know, uh, I, I, I have published some papers and done some work that touches slightly on this vis-a-vis -vis algorithmic amplification, which Signal does not do, and the sort of, you know, perverse incentives of the kind of, you know, uh, attention model. Um, I will also say that I don't think this is solely a technical problem. In the US, you also saw a kind of defunding and consolidation of media and other factors that I think play into social media becoming kind of a, you know, the, the increasingly like metastatic ground truth. Um, so I think it's really complicated. It's not my area of expertise, um, but I have touched on it and I would, I would suggest reading, you know, from folks like Joan Donovan and Becca Lewis and others who are thinking about sort of you know, this misinformation or, you know, kind of uh, conversation silos. I, I, there's another term for it, but it's, I'm a little jet lagged. Um, <laughs> um, who've been thinking about that for a long time and, and uh, you know, with a holistic lens. Cool. Thank you so much, Meredith. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Okay. <laughs>